Uh, so we know within this text, you know, having to use the uh, Bible app on my iPad tonight, I left my physical copy at home. But when we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 23, we noted that at this point that that day that uh, that David again is on the run from Saul. Part of the problem, as we saw last week, what happened in 1 Samuel 22 is that the uh, is that Saul has killed the priest of Nob. And where we left off was that, uh, again, that Abiathar had fled to David, and, and we sort of, and Kat, we sort of titled that section of First Samuel twenty-two, right? The uh, that Saul is sort of the destroyer of religion in Judaism, uh, whereas David is more so the protector of, of Judaism, because Saul's trying to kill the priesthood, David's trying to save Abiathar the priest. And the implications of that stretch forth into what we're talking about tonight because uh, the, 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 the fact that Saul cuts himself off from the, the priest of the Lord uh, uh, becomes apparent, but it also uh, is something that we're going to note on multiple occasions tonight, the, the ramifications of that. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump in. 1 Samuel 23, uh, looking at verse 1. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines... I'm sorry, let me pull up. Uh, then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. All right, so, Dad, go ahead and pull up those pictures for me real quick. So, we have to keep in mind that the last time we've seen, we saw David was back in chapter 22, verse 5. David had fled back to Judah, and it said that he was dwelling in the forest of Hereth. Now, if you look at the picture on the screen, I don't know how well you can tell it from back here, uh, but right there in the middle, Dad, do you have that PowerPoint with you? Can you point at Jerusalem with that laser? I don't know if you can see. <laughs> You're right there, right there where that word is. All right, so you notice that's Jerusalem there. Uh, where Saul and his men were located in Gibeah would have been to the northeast of that city. However, we note that David was hiding in the forest of Hereth. If you notice, uh, move to the west, you see that green patch on the screen, uh, that sort of west, southwest of Jerusalem. You know what that is? Trees. Trees. That's, that's a forest there. And... More than likely, this is where David was actually hiding out. Now, keep in mind, Saul's capital at this point was Gibeah. Uh, but we were told that the forest of Hereth, uh, that's probably the general location for them. Um, and that's a map of modern-day Israel. That gives you an idea about where uh, David's hiding out at this point. Now, if you'll go to the next picture for us, it's... Uh... Nope, I left that picture out, but... Uh, the the picture uh, the picture that I had intended for that was um, was actually a, a picture of the forest itself. And I, if you've seen this, if you look at a picture of the Smoky Mountains, that they look very similar. Um, it's a it's a pretty elevated place. Uh, it's a, obviously a very wooded place. If you've seen again, if you've seen a picture of the Smoky Mountains during sort of like the summertime when the trees are in uh, where the trees have all the, the all of their leaves you kind of get an idea of what it looks like so this is a sort of a remote place it's an easy place to stay and david has inquired about this city Keilah. and yeah okay so what you're looking at there on the screen is the archaeological uh, excavations thought to be uh, centered around this city called Keilah. Now, based on what you're looking at, it, it seems pretty small. Uh, we're told that this, uh, th this place is located about three miles south of the cave of Adullam, which is where David hid in chapter 22, verse 1. Uh, but this is supposed to be the remains of the city of Keilah. Now, in Joshua 15, 44, we note that Keilah also had villages surrounding it. So this is what we might think of as sort of the center of the city, but there are other villages surrounding it, so not everybody's living within the confines of that uh, circular space. Uh, go to the next picture for me. Okay, so the picture on your left, that's just another picture 
uh, of the city of Kela. That's actually standing in the, in the excavation site. You note that it's uh, built on a hill, just as a lot of cities back then were for protection purposes. Uh, we're told there that the entrance uh, that you sort of see, uh, that if you would highlight the, the entrance there of the city. Yeah, it's, yeah, go up a little bit. Yeah, right there. We're told that that's one, where one of the gates of the city uh, often uh, would have been situated, but you get an idea of what, uh, again, of what the city looked like. Now, you note at the top right, that's actually pottery um, that they found in the city. Uh, I'm not, exa- I don't think it traces back to the time of David, but that's po- pottery that they found there. The uh, bottom right picture is uh, obviously, I, I mean, I can't read it. I'm sure no one in here can read it, but that's actually uh, a written language that's found within the pottery. And from what I can tell, I do not think that is Hebrew. Um, but those are just some pictures, maybe helps give you an image here about where the, the city of Kela is located at. That's where we're focused in on uh, for a large part of our time tonight. Dad, if you would go back to the uh, text for us. All right. So looking back at the text, verse 1, we, we, we talked about uh, where Kela is located, some pictures of it. Uh, one thing that we want to look at now, uh, in verse 1, uh, or we'll note that in a minute. All right, notice at the end of verse 1, uh, the Philistines, they fight against Kela, they rob the threshing floors. Uh, Go move forward again. I forgot there is one more picture. Yeah. All right. So that is a picture of a threshing floor, at least an outdoor threshing floor. Uh, and a threshing floor was used obviously to separate the uh, grain from the wheat, as you can tell by the picture there. In order to do that, you had to have a tremendous amount of weight to press down on the grain. A lot of times they used oxen for that, and. What's given here is obviously the, the, the idea that they are taking the grain. And this is probably in reference to the fact that this is occurring around harvest time. Back in Judges chapter 6, during the time of Gideon, we're told that the Midianites and the Amalekites, uh, part of how they afflicted Israel is that when Israel began to uh, harvest their crops, that they would come in and take those crops. This is basically what's happening here in the city of Keilah. The Philistines are coming in as soon as they are uh, going out, bringing in the crops from harvest and taking their crops. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen the the Disney movie, uh, It's a Bug's Life, but that's the the premise of that movie. Uh, Watching it growing up, uh, the the movie is focused on ants that that are trying to collect for the winter season. And there's a point in time where the the grasshoppers come in and take whatever they want. Sort of kind of like the the Philistines are doing here to those people that lived in that live in Kela. All right, so, all right, go ahead and move forward, Dad, uh, to the text. All right, so, verse 2, Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Kela. All right, now, something to keep in mind here. Note that David is able to inquire of the Lord at this moment. Now, why that's important is because if you remember back in chapter 22 when David, I'm sorry, chapter 21 when David went and met with Ahimelech the priest, that Doeg said that David had to go to the priest to inquire of the Lord. That was one of the accusations made against him. But you notice here that David's able to do this on his own, right? He doesn't have Ahimelech with him. Now, we'll note in verse 6 that Apparently, Abathar has not arrived yet. So there, there could be a question that arises. if How is David able to inquire of the Lord if the priest is not there yet? Well, keep in mind that we read in 22 verse 5 that Gad had actually met David in Moab and told him to come back to Judah. And perhaps that's how he's communicating with God through the prophet Gad. The question again is, should I go and attack the Philistines? Now, keep in mind that David's on the run. Uh, Conventional wisdom, the wise, wise wisdom here would say that, you know, you need to lay low. And so David's mind, perhaps it's not convenient to go and attack the 
Philistines who are afflicting the people of Keilah, if that means that Saul hears about it. However, David consults the Lord about the matter. You note verse 2 that he, is, uh, he, that, that he was informed about this. It could have very well been that some of the inhabitants of Keilah actually went to David for help because he was nearby. I don't know how many of you have ever seen the movie. I'm sure you've all heard of it, The Magnificent Seven. Uh, it came out back in the 1950s and the 1960s. But the premise of that movie was that there was a, a village that was being afflicted by uh, this group of individuals, and some of the villagers go to seek help to defend the city. Perhaps this is, this is exactly what's going on here. The men of Keilah know that David's a, a powerful warrior, uh, a successful military general. Perhaps they go and try to get David's support to help save the city. Nevertheless, David wants to inquire of the Lord. Is it a good idea to do that? And God says, go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. Now, in the book of 1 Samuel, the word save often indicates either the actions of God or the actions of God's appointed man. And what David is going to do here is obviously fulfill the actions of God. So hence the word that he's going to save the city of Keilah. Just like in other passages in 1 Samuel, you read about God saving the Israelites. David's acting as God's representative. But here's the problem, verse 3. There's a hesitation here. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Now, in Joshua 15, 44, the city was said to be in Judah. But if you pay attention to how they phrase this statement in verse 3, we be afraid here in Judah. And what they're saying here is almost as though the city of Keilah is no longer in the boundaries of Jerusalem. And so it could have been that through the, 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 the Philistine success against Saul that they had taken the city of Keilah. And so they have great fear here because if we go and attack Keilah, now we're going to make the Philistines our enemy when we have Saul pursuing after us. You know, you could think within their minds, is Saul going to hear about this? If we've got two enemies to fight, how are we going to handle this situation? And, and keep in mind, this is, these statements are all being made after God has told David that he should go and save Keilah. And so in David's mind, here's something that he does that's wise. He goes and he asks God again about the matter. Verse 4, uh, Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. What David does here is he just seeks reassurance from God in the matter. If you recall the story of Gideon, Gideon does that in Judges chapter 6 with the, uh, the, woolen, cloak, the woolen coat that he has. He, he gets God to perform uh, that uh, miracle in two different ways to show confirmation. You know, there's nothing wrong with seeking reassurance from God. That's why we keep in mind, you know, there, there's some things that we understand. I know I mentioned Matthew 6 about how God takes care of His people, right? That's something that we all know, but that still shouldn't stop us from praying to God and asking for help, right? Or, or seeking reassurance from God to help fulfill that. You remember in, in Matthew chapter 26, you know, Jesus didn't pray to God one time when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus knew everything that was about to happen, yet it didn't stop him from seeking reassurance from God to keep praying. Uh, because reassurance from God is, is very helpful. It, it indicates to us, just like David, if David feels the need to find reassurance by continuing to communicate with God, it, it shows to us that we need to be continual in our prayer. Uh, because it shows that we need God's assurance uh, about whatever is going on in life. And, that, and that's something that we all uh, should try to model ourselves after in terms of how we pray to, to, to continue to ask God for help, which is what David's doing here. Now, you note that, that God's reassurance here is that they are going to be successful. I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men have the needed courage to go forth and to save the inhabitants of Keilah. That's where we move to in verse 5. 
So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Now here's a good question uh, that I, uh, I was thinking about. Where is Saul in all of this? You know, Saul was called to be the captain of God's people. He's called to be the protector of the Israelites. But you don't read anywhere here about the inhabitants of Keilah trying to get Saul to come to their aid. You don't read anything at this point yet about Saul coming to the defense of the city. And it's, it is interesting. it's an interesting thought to keep in mind as we go forward because David's going to portray Saul as the destroyer of the city rather than as the savior, which, is he's, which he fulfills here in verse 5 by, by taking care and defending the city. Uh, so keep that in mind. David, verse 5 indicates to us, David's victory was complete. There was a great slaughter. They took their cattle as well. Uh, sometimes cattle would have, would have been used to uh, transport the grain, but... The idea here is that, you know, David didn't just, and his men didn't just beat the Philistines to the point where they just sort of retreated a little bit. But if you went in and you had a great slaughter, if you were able to take their cattle, that indicates that you drove them back. That's sort of the idea of a complete victory here that all came about because of their trust and reliance on the help of God. So that by verse 6, And it came to pass when Abiathar the son of Ahimelech fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Now we remember David's protection of Abiathar, chapter 22, verses 20 through 23. That event actually takes place now. I know chapter 22 was written before chapter 23, but again, the indication here is that that event in 22, verses 20 through 23, happened when Abiathar came to the city of Keilah, which David now lives in Keilah because he's defended the city. And so when you think back to when David told Abiathar that I will be your safeguard, you're going to be safe with me, carries a little bit more weight with it now because David has just had this amazing victory over the Philistines in the city of Keilah in which they were outnumbered. So Abiathar has great reason to trust in what David says. But the important thing in verse 6 is that what Ahimelech brought with him, or what Abathar brought with him, and that was the ephod. Again, as we noted, with the ephod now residing with David, Saul has lost his ability to communicate and to hear uh, from God. He's lost another method of doing that, whereas David now has a new way of inquiring of the Lord. Uh, so, you know, sometimes we think about, you know, sometimes we, we, if we're not very familiar with this story, we might want to have a sympathetic view of Saul to a certain extent, as though it didn't matter what Saul did, God had completely cut him off. But what you see pictured in 1 Samuel is that Saul over and over again is basically burning his bridges with God, whether that's driving the prophets away uh, as he did with, you know, alienating Samuel, whether that was driving the priest away when he killed them in Nob, whether that was driving off his communication away because Abiathar now flees to, to find refuge in David and not with Saul. Saul throughout this entire rest of the book is constantly burning his bridges that cuts him off from communication with God. And so in that way, he's not a very sympathetic figure at all because now David not only has the prophets, but he has the priesthood on his side. Now we come to verse 7. David hears, or Saul hears about what happens in the city. Verse 7, it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah, and Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. So apparently the word of the battle spread to Saul uh, that way he knew where David was at. Now, you think about this entire situation, right? David has just saved a city that probably has a lot of Israelites within it. Even though the men of Judah were hesitant about uh, going to uh, protect the city, David and his men protected the Israelites in this city. And you would think that what would be owed to David was... 
what we might could say is the key to the city, right? He protected the city. He saved the, the lives of many Israelites. You would think that maybe Saul has a change of heart that, you know, there's a certain sense of gratitude towards David for what he has done. But that's not the picture that Saul has at all, right? He looks at this as an opportunity instead of praising David or thanking David for what he's done, looks at this as an opportunity to capture and kill David. Now, you know, verse 7, right? God hath delivered him into mine hand. This is why it's, it's important to note about the ephod leaving Saul. Saul had no way to know what God's will was because he was constantly burning his bridges that allowed him communication with God. And for that very reason, it's almost humorous that he makes this statement when at every turn he's been burning his bridges. Uh, he, he's been cutting off his communication from God. But yet he tells the men that are, that are with him, right, God has delivered David into my hand as though Saul is, uh, is being instructed by God on the matter. Uh, and, and that, you know, that brings up a, a good point of application, right? We can't have guidance from God if we don't allow God to speak to us. It's why we pray. It's why we study. If I don't pray, if I'm not studying, I'm cutting myself off from God's ability, ability to communicate to me. And I may not be killing individuals like Saul is, but I'm doing the same problem of cutting myself off from the help of God. And that's something that we obviously don't want to do, but... Uh, but, but that's the exact problem that Saul has fallen into. Nevertheless, he still says he's being communicated. He's, he, God is communicating to him. Now note that he says that God had delivered him into my hand. The word there in verse 7, delivered, is actually different from the word in verse 3 where it says that David was to save or to deliver the men of Keilah. The word deliver in verse 7 indicates or what the actual meaning of that is to regard as foreign or strange. And so what Saul is saying here is that God, uh, that David has alienated or that he is a foreigner to God is what's being communicated here. Now, you know the irony of that, right? Because who's really, between Saul and David, who's the foreigner or who is strange from God? Who's cut himself off from God? It's Saul, right? Uh, but yet Saul's trying to, to say that David's the one who is the alien or, or a foreigner from God. Uh, it's sort of the same idea that Paul would say in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, when he said that the Gentiles were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They were cut off from the, the, uh, the, the covenant uh, that the Jews and the proselytes enjoyed uh, in Judaism with God. Sort of the same sense here. Of course, Saul is lying throughout this entire process, but you know that David is shut up. Uh, he, he is in a, he is entered, he's entered into a town that hath gates and bars. A lot of times the gates and bars, that's just representative of a, uh, really representative of a uh, city that is well protected. But a city that's well protected can also mean that it's hard to get out of. And... The idea here is just that David is trapped. He can't get out of the city. David and Saul looks at that as an opportune moment to attack. In the Annals of Sennacherib, which is a, a collection of documents that archaeologists found, when Sennacherib trapped Hezekiah or, and, and had the city of Jerusalem uh, circled around during the reign of King Hezekiah, he said that he had Hezekiah trapped like a bird in a cage. Perhaps that's the idea that Saul has here. He's got David trapped as a bird in a cage, whereas it's hard for the cat to, to get into the cage. It's almost impossible for the bird to get out of the cage, right? And, and sort of, So that's sort of the idea that Saul has. He's trapped. Nowhere to go. So that by verse 8, Saul assembles his army. Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. When you think about a call like this, not only is this just a call to war, but this is also a call to test the, the loyalty of the Israelites. Right? If you don't assemble with me to go and to uh, go to the city of Keilah and to get David then you, if you refuse to do that, 
then you are essentially you're aiding the enemy. You have sided with David. So this is a test of loyalty. But yet, uh, and, and so if you did not answer the call, that meant that you sided with David. Um, I, I thought about this, you know, sometimes as Christians, you know, you try to find middle ground sometimes on, on matters where, you know, that, that are not essential to salvation. But there's sometimes where there is a definite right or wrong. Uh, there's a definite right or wrong side. Obviously, the definite right or wrong side is David being right, Saul is in the wrong. You know, likewise, as Christians, sometimes there, there is no middle ground in this situation. We either got to, you know, we've got to be one side or the other. Hopefully, we're sticking on the right side. You know, when Jesus said in Matthew 10, 34, that I came not to send peace, but, but uh, brought a sword. You know, the idea that he's pointing out there was that, you know, you've got to pick a side, one or the other. And, and, and in that context, we referred to it before. But that's where, again, he refers to, you know, you can't, you know, you can't love father or mother more than me and, and be a servant of me. You've got to pick one or the other. And so that's what Saul's trying to do here. You've got to pick a side. You're either coming to support me or if you ignore that, you're automatically siding with the enemy. But again, here's, here's the interesting thing. If God is on Saul's side, why does he need all the people to come together to go and to attack the city of Kelo where David's men are at. I'll go ahead and say verse, I believe verse 10 or a little bit down, it's actually David and 600 men. That's not a lot of men. The last time where we saw Saul assemble the army in this same manner, he had 200,000 soldiers at his disposal. But again, if God is on his side, why did he need so many men to help him take down David, who was the enemy of God? Because you remember the book of Joshua, right? Joshua was told this by God. Joshua told the Israelites this. doesn't matter how many men you have. If you put your trust in God, you rely on him in battle, you're going to be able to drive the enemy away. No matter how many men that they have. You think back to other occasions in Israel's history, right? You think about David and Goliath, right? Size didn't matter in that battle. Numbers didn't matter in that battle. The walls of Jericho fell. Uh, it didn't matter, right? Numbers didn't matter in that situation. So if, if God being on your side means that numbers don't matter, why did Saul need to have all of these men assembled with him? Well, turns out God really wasn't on his side, right? And I think that, that's illustrated here in verse 8. He didn't have any reason to call all the people together if God was really on his side. All right, so now moving on to verse 9. Well, I'll go ahead and stop there. Are there any thoughts or comments on what we've read thus far? Saul had a classic case of tunnel vision. I mean, all he could see was David. He's got problems in the nation here, problems there. But again, he just plows full steam ahead, focused only on David, and ignores the, really the needs of the kingdom. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, uh, that's going to become very, very much clear by the words of David regarding Saul's actions. Now, as we look at verse 9, so again, Saul knew that Saul, uh, David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abathar the priest, "Bring here the ephod." Now you keep in mind, David had a lot of experience, knowing that Saul's words did not always line up with his intent. Chapter eighteen, we we've talked about that before. You can think about the examples in that chapter. Uh, from what verse 9 indicates, it seems like Saul might have called this assembly to come to Keilah under a different reason than, than trying to find David. Perhaps it was to save the city uh, like David was going to try to do. But, but the important thing is David recognizes that Saul's actually trying to find him and to get him. And so what does David do? Well, he does what he's constantly been doing, right? He seeks the Lord for help. He Tells Abathar, bring here the ephod. Uh, and I'll just mention this if you want to put it in your Bibles. Exodus chapter 28 is where you first read about the, the ephod, how it was designed, what it looked like. The, the two stones, the Urim and the Thummim, which were used to uh, communicate with God or to, to receive a message from God. We might have an idea. We don't really know how they worked specifically, but we might have an idea based on 
what David asked in verses 10 through 11. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Now, again, right, note the words here. David was the protector of the city. How does he portray Saul here? What word? Yeah, Saul, David is not, Saul is not coming to protect the city of Keilah. He's coming to destroy the city for my sake. You, you know, you've got the picture there of David just saving the inhabitants, but here comes Saul willing to kill all of these Israelites that, that David has just saved if it means finding David. And again, you, you get in mind a picture here of a man that, as, as, as Brother Wayne noted, he's completely focused on David and he doesn't care who gets in his way, doesn't care how many innocent people have to get hurt. And so Saul is over and over again, not, not only is he cutting his communication with God, he's proving himself to not be a great leader for the Israelites. David, on the other hand, is proving himself to be a great leader. David, again, is willing to save the city. In fact, I'll, I'll say this about the word destroy there. It comes from the Hebrew word meaning pit, which is where the Hebrew word sheol comes from. And sheol is, is the uh, Hebrew word to reference the grave. Uh, so David's really, David's saying, again, he's come to destroy the city. He's, go, he's coming to uh, put these Israelites in the grave, so to speak, is, is how David's putting this. So let's move on to verses 11 and 12. Uh, we're going to try to get down to verse 13 tonight. I know we're moving kind of quickly. Uh, we're going to try to get down to verse 13. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, He will come down. In verse 12, Then said David, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up. Now, you know the type of questions that David asked here. Um, these are what we might call yes or no questions. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? And generally, you would answer that with a yes or no. Well, again, likewise, will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? Again, you generally answer that as a yes or no. The question in verse 12, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? Again, same question. Again, you answer yes or no. From what we understand of this, basically, uh, and, I, and, and this is looking at what we have before us, but apparently the two stones, the Urim and the Thummim, either answered yes or no. And I'm not exactly sure how it works. I don't think the Bible reveals, Brother Wayne can comment on that if he wants, but I don't think the Bible reveals in specific details about how this worked. But most people, most scholars seem to believe that these the Urim and the Thummim were two stones that either represented that represented the words yes or no. And however the process went, whatever stone, whatever it was, that, that gave the answer to the question. But the important thing is, is that it was God's way of communicating to the Israelites, which David has that at his disposal, Saul does not. But you know that God here says that not only is Saul coming down, but also that the inhabitants of Keilah would deliver David to Saul. Now, naturally, you would think, why would the inhabitants of Keilah turn in the man that just saved them? Right? Doesn't seem like a great thing to do. Sort of seems like a, you know, sort of a sorry move to do. Not, not very fair to David at all, right? Because David just saved them from the, the Philistines. Well, I mean, you, if you try to put yourselves in your shoes, maybe you can, we, we might can think about, if we, if we put ourselves in their shoes, we might can come up with some answers, right? You know, we don't have to look very far back to the last chapter. What, what did Saul do to the priest of Nob? Slaughtered them. Not only did he slaughter them, he slaughtered their families, he slaughtered their livestock, took all their property away. They heard about what was happening. And keep in mind that David was not in the city. And if Saul was willing to go to that extent to just to get information about David, how far is he willing to go to actually get David now that he knows that he is in the city of Keilah? The punishment might be a whole lot worse for us if we continue to hold on to David. They also might think to themselves that now 
it turns out David has put us in a worse situation than where we are before. Because all we had to really worry about before was the Philistines coming and taking our grain away from us during harvest time. But now here comes Saul who's willing again to kill all the inhabitants of the city if that means getting to David. We can save ourselves if we just give David over to Saul. Perhaps that's why they wanted to turn their back on David. But, you know, again, you think about the question, why is it that Christians turn their back on Jesus? Why do Christians turn their back on their Savior? Um, And we know why, right? There, There are a lot of reasons why. Some do it, some in that you can read in the New Testament, some did it out of fear. Some people did it out of, you know, wanting the things of this world that they couldn't have after following Jesus. There, there are a lot of reasons why Christians turn their back on their Savior. So, you know, we might give the, the inhabitants of Keilah a hard time for wanting to deliver, uh, for delivering David to Saul. But, you know, think about how many times we feel the desire to turn our back on Jesus to, to get what we want. Or uh, maybe because we feel like we're going to be in a better position if we do so. Just a... A thought to think about there. David, thus, verse 12, he's going to get out of the city. Go ahead and move to verse 13, if you will, and that's what we're going to close tonight. David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went wherever they could. And it was told Saul that David was escaped, or that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbeared to go forth. Again, David only had about 600 men. No reason for Saul to need all the men of Israel if God was on his side. But of course he wasn't. You notice here that David and his men wandered or went whithersoever they could go. You know, the Israelites were punished for wandering, but that's not the indication here. Uh, You get the indication here that David and his men were trusting in God wherever they went because they didn't have a home anymore. Right? Israel was not their home anymore. They were men that were wanted. Right? They were on the run. No place of security. As we close tonight, you can sort of think about where David and his men were at, not having a home in Israel. Christians, you know, were said to be strangers, foreigners, at least in a sense, with, the, with this earthly world. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 9 through 16, just as the writer of Hebrews was saying, just as those men were seeking after a city built by God, or a reference to heaven, we and likewise do so by our faith. We are living based on our faith that we won't be here, right, for a long time, at least relatively speaking. We, you know, we won't be here for eternally, and that's why by faith we are seeking a better city. We are foreigners and strangers on this earth, sort of in the same way that David was at this point because he was seeking and had his faith placed in God. Well, that being said, are there any comments or thoughts before we close tonight? David dispels the notion if you're God's man, you know, some have the idea if you're God's man, nothing bad will happen to you, you know, like Job. But David was certainly God's man and kept praying to God. But again, that didn't mean that God would just build a fortress around him and nothing bad would happen. So, you know, bad things can happen to good people. Right, right. Bad things can happen to good people. And fortunately for David, everything will work out fine and just... We know that spiritually, if we're faithful to God, things will work out fine as well. But again, with that being said, we'll uh, stop here tonight. Thank you for your time and thank you for your attention. We'll pick up uh, in verse 14 next week and try to get through the end of the chapter.